The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. In a Dublin courtroom in March 1653, Chief Justice Gerard Lowther addressed the defendant before him. Through the man's actions, innocent blood had been, quote, most wickedly and cruelly shed upon the land, against the laws of God and man, of nature and of nations, the laws of the land, and the rights and rules of war, and the bonds of humanity and humane society. The defendant was guilty, directly and through inspiring others, of the deaths of, quote, some hundreds of thousands of these Protestants. The scale of the crimes, the defendant's own and those of his countrymen who he had inspired, was so vast that, quote, the punishment must be extraordinary. The defendant was Sir Phelim O'Neill. Up until 1641, he had been a loyal subject of the Stuart monarchy and one of the so-called deserving Irish, given land in the plantation of Ulster. He had been an enthusiastic planter, evicting his Irish tenants in favour of English and Scottish settlers, and growing vastly wealthy in the process. This loyalty, and this success, had not won him security. As an Irish Catholic, he was denied any substantial role in the government of Ireland, and his ethnic and religious status meant that his rights were forever under threat from that government. He was far from alone in these worries, and after watching the Scots successfully enforce their rights upon the king in the Scottish Revolution and the Bishop Wars, O'Neill and others like him plotted their own resistance. The conspiracy, which intended to quickly seize key forts in Ulster as well as the seat of government, Dublin Castle, would have presented their enemies in Ireland and elsewhere with a fait accompli. Concessions for Irish Catholics would have been wrung out of the king, and their rights to land ownership would be secure. Instead, though O'Neill's part in the plot went off without a hitch, his co-conspirators failed to take Dublin. What had been intended as a surgical coup d'etat devolved into a mass uprising, and thousands of English, Welsh and Scottish colonists, including many of O'Neill's own tenants, were killed by their Irish neighbours. Atrocity was met with atrocity, as the Dublin government recovered and reacted with equal, often greater, violence. The Irish rebels would soon formalise their resistance into the Irish Confederacy, and the island of Ireland would suffer more than a decade of civil war. Throughout the First, Second, and Third English Civil Wars, the Solemn League and Covenant, Montrose's Year of Victories, the Engagement, the Trial and Execution of Charles I, and the Formation of the Commonwealth, Ireland burned and bled. Sir Phelim O'Neill had survived all of it. He'd fought for the Confederacy, sometimes supporting, sometimes opposing, his more famous kinsman Owen Roe O'Neill and the Papal Nuncio, Archbishop Rinaccini. At times, he had been a powerful and influential figure, and at others, he was sidelined and powerless. His final fall came after a stoic defence of Charlemont Castle in 1650, the same fort he'd captured in 1641, sparking the rebellion in the first place. Once the castle surrendered, O'Neill went into hiding, 
fighting in the guerrilla war until he was captured in February 1653. Now, here in March 1653, Sir Phelim O'Neill faced his fate before the High Court of Justice. The London news sheets relished in the comeuppance of the man they saw as the mastermind of the Irish massacres, and they described him as cowering, sobbing, begging for his life through his tears. O'Neill instead showed immense personal courage. In his testimony, he only implicated the co-conspirators who he knew were either dead or already known to the English. Of course, the High Court wanted one name in particular, the late Charles Stuart, former King of Ireland as well as England and Scotland. O'Neill had already implicated his sovereign a decade before, when he published a commission supposedly issued by the King to rebel against Dublin in his name. Charles denied it all, of course, but the promise that they were fighting for the king won many Irish Catholics over, just as it damned him in the eyes of his Protestant subjects in all three kingdoms. Now, though, O'Neill refused to stand by it. Instead, he admitted that he had forged the commission himself. The king had known nothing of the rebellion. Even when offered a pardon, or at least his life, if he stuck to his original story, O'Neill would not incriminate the dead king. Sir Phelim O'Neill was found guilty and sentenced to be executed as a traitor. Five days later, on the 10th of March 1653, he was marched onto the scaffold in Dublin, and then hanged, drawn and quartered. The remains of his body were impaled at the gates of Dublin, Dundalk, Lisnagarvi and Drogheda, Nearly 12 years after the outbreak of the Irish Rebellion, Sir Phelim O'Neill's execution marks a symbolic point in its history. Three months later, the Commonwealth Parliament declared that the rebellion was crushed. An English government had reconquered Ireland, and it would never be the same again. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 3, Episode 14, To Hell or Connacht. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Dr. Samuel Hume. Before we begin, I have to thank a new addition to the House of Lords, Earl Brandon of Grant. Like all other patrons, they can now listen to this episode and every other episode ad-free. The new Earl can also listen to the bonus content, which includes the latest episode in our series on the Mughal Empire. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Last week, we covered the end of the war in Ireland. Though armed resistance to English rule will remain throughout the period of the Protectorate and the Commonwealth, it will mostly be limited to small-scale banditry. The New Model Army crushed the Tories, veteran Irish soldiers fighting a guerrilla war, through constant military pressure and ruthlessly denying them support from the local population. Civilian populations in regions of Tory activity were expelled, concentrated into specific villages, or summarily executed as spies and collaborators. Crops and livestock were taken or destroyed, and Commonwealth troops learned, lesson by bloody lesson, how to fight an insurgency. Tory leaders soon came to terms, usually leading their forces out of Ireland to fight for the Spanish or the French. The final death toll, after more than a decade of war, was perhaps a third of the pre-war population of 2.1 million people. But the Commonwealth had won. England had thoroughly, completely conquered Ireland. In today's episode, we will see how the Irish people, those that still lived anyway, were to be treated under the new regime. Over the next three episodes, we will look at the so-called Cromwellian Settlement of Ireland, as the new English government attempted to meet two broad objectives in the country. The first was a high-minded, if patronising, autocratic and morally questionable desire to reform Irish laws and society. 
There was a genuine desire from many English officials to see ordinary Irish people freed, quote-unquote, from what they saw as backwards laws and customs, which left ordinary Irish beholden to tyrannical sept leaders, old English aristocrats, and superstitious Catholic priests. The foundation of these views were, of course, bigoted and prejudiced in the extreme, but there was at least in their rhetoric a hope that, when the Irish were properly civilised, they would be better off. To quote from C.S. Lewis, those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. The second broad objective was far more practical, more cynical. It was to pay off the government's creditors, the adventurers who had subscribed to the Adventurers Act of 1642, and the soldiers who were still owed wages. This all required money that the Commonwealth simply did not have, and the distribution of Irish land became a valuable way to keep all those veteran soldiers happy, or at least keep them from leading another revolution. In terms of laws, there are three major acts passed by the Parliament of England which helped define the post-war settlement. The first has been with our narrative since 1642, since before the First English Civil War. It was one of the last pieces of legislation that both Charles I and his Parliament agreed on, before they set about trying to kill each other. The Adventurers Act. This was, as a reminder, a way to raise money in order to send an army to put down the Irish Rebellion. Individuals and corporations would adventure their money, think venture as in venture capital, with the offer of a return on their investment in forfeited Irish land, taken from Irish rebels. The money they offered was meant to pay for the army which would put down those rebels, but we know how that went. Famously, Oliver Cromwell, still just a relatively unknown MP, was one of those who put their money where their mouth was. This lay behind much of parliamentary policy towards Ireland throughout the Wars of the Three Kingdoms. The land of rebels had already been bought and paid for, so any peace in Ireland couldn't avoid land confiscation. The next piece of legislation came in 1652, with the Act for the Settling of Ireland which stated the range of punishments that were to be brought against the enemies of Parliament. In the preamble to the Act, it lists 104 men who were to be excluded from any pardons granted to others. The names included Confederates, Royalists, and those who switched sides, and included leading lights such as the Marquis of Ormond, the Earl of Clanricard, Lord Inchiquin, and Sir Phelim O'Neill. Most of these men had already escaped or been exiled, but not all. As we saw, Sir Phelim was one of those who stayed behind. The list is a who's who of the rich and powerful in Ireland, and every single one of them forfeited their, often substantial, estates. The third act came in 1653, the Act of Satisfaction. These three acts combined provided the legal framework for the post-war settlement. Besides the Lord Deputy of Ireland, Henry Ireton, and then Charles Fleetwood, and then Henry Cromwell, the other major players in the administration of the new order in Ireland were four civil commissioners. Edmund Ludlow was one of those. The commissioners answered directly to Parliament, not the Council of State. And in 1653, the Protectorate, the military government of Oliver Cromwell, was established, and that changed the balance of power even further. The different priorities and conflicting orders help explain why the settlement was carried out as it was. The Cromwellian settlement of Ireland can broadly be seen in four ways. Land confiscation, transportation, transplantation, and colonisation. The first is inseparable from the others, and we'll cover that in a moment, but there is a difference between transportation and transplantation. It's a distinction that many, but not all, historians and contemporaries make, but I think it's a useful difference, and so I'll use it. Transportation was the policy of sending people, former soldiers or Tories, priests and ordinary Irish people, out of Ireland and the Commonwealth. We'll have an episode dedicated to that policy, as thousands of people are forcibly taken to the English colonies, particularly in the Caribbean, and forced to work as indentured servants. Transplantation was the policy of moving people within Ireland, and as the name of today's episode suggests, the Commonwealth and Protectorate government chose the province of Connacht 
as the primary destination for transplantation. That phrase, to hell or Connacht, is usually attributed to Oliver Cromwell, and has become famous in popular history for good reason. It pretty effectively channels the contempt felt by the English towards the Irish, and threatens death for anyone who refused to be transplanted. Both points are accurate, as we'll see, but to be a killjoy, no contemporary, and certainly not Cromwell, is ever recorded saying it. It's a myth, born from popular memory. But it's good for an episode title, so forgive me for succumbing to the temptation of marketing. This legal framework for the settlement was very black and white. Anyone who was known to be involved in the 1641 rebellion, or who fought English troops before the regularisation of the rebellion into the Catholic Confederacy in late 1642, was to be executed and their lands seized as traitors. No ifs or buts. The atrocities of the rebellion would not be forgotten nor forgiven. Protestants, whether new or old English, Scots or the few Gaelic Protestants who had opposed Parliament would have a third of their lands confiscated. For example, this accounted for about 10% of Protestant landowners in Donegal and Tyrone, mostly those known to have laid siege to Derry in 1649. Catholic landowners who had opposed Parliament would have their lands confiscated, losing two-thirds outright and receiving land equal to one-third in Connacht, where they were also ordered to move to. Catholic landowners who had remained neutral, or at least could not adequately prove that they had supported Parliament, would lose one-third to confiscation, and receive land in Connacht equal to two-thirds of their previous estate. And again, anyone who had fought in the rebellion, or before the founding of the Confederacy, had all of their estate confiscated, and they would be lucky to keep their lives. Protestant landowners facing confiscation not only had a far smaller portion of their estates taken, but they also didn't have to move, and they could pay a fine to get their sequestered lands back. Those Irish Catholic landowners who could prove that they had supported not just England, but the English Parliament during the wars were, in theory, untouched by the settlement. However, actually proving that could be difficult. If they'd been in territory controlled by the Confederacy, like most of Ireland, how exactly could they show they'd supported Parliament? Outward displays of support for the enemy would have opened them up to punishment from the Confederates, so it was much easier for Catholics in territory which had been controlled by Parliament for a long time to find this evidence. Porig Lenehan suggests that this partly explains why more than half of Catholic land in County Dublin was preserved, compared to neighbouring County Meath, which saw three quarters of Catholic land confiscated. If you remember the Battle of Rath Mines, and the guide who led Ormond's army on a march which took up most of the night and left them vulnerable to attack in the morning. I mentioned in that episode that this guide would later use this service to protect his lands in the settlement. This was one of the ways you could show evidence of supporting Parliament. But you probably noticed that I kept saying landowners, because despite the wishes of some radicals more later, the Act of Settlement wasn't intended to target all Catholics. In fact, echoing previous Cromwellian proclamations, the Act of Settlement insisted in its preamble that the new government had no intention of, quote, extirpating the whole nation, end quote. Mercy and pardon were offered to, quote, all husbandmen, ploughmen, labourers, artificers, and others of the inferior sort, as long as they lived peaceably and obediently provided, of course, that they hadn't supported the rebellion, and Parliament's definition of support was very broad and opened up a lot of people to charges if officials wanted to press them. But Scott Spurlock has argued that official violence against the Irish Catholic population didn't happen as often as it's popularly believed. Instead, quote, The fact is, the tradition of civilians being slaughtered owes more to the imputation of the 1640s onto the popular memory of the 1650s than to any extant historical evidence, end quote. It isn't that there was no violence. Hundreds were executed, summarily or otherwise, just that it wasn't as common or as integral to Commonwealth rule as it's usually seen. Of course, Spurlock makes a point of concluding his chapter in Constructing the Past, Writing Irish History, by acknowledging the vast level of suffering experienced by the Irish population during Cromwellian rule. 
bigoted and sectarian acts of violence, whether or not they were backed up by bigoted and sectarian policy, made thousands of Irish lives miserable and often short. The Commonwealth focused on the landowners, not just because the government wanted their land, although it did, but because they were often the leaders of their communities. They were landlords, local gentry, or traditional sept leaders. If another rebellion erupted, it would be down to the machinations of these untrustworthy elites, so the thinking went. Much better, and much safer for everyone, to remove them from their bases of power and disperse them. Their tenants and peasants, now freed from traditional bonds of loyalty and service, could then serve English Protestant interests, and everyone would be better off. So the thinking went anyway. During Ireton's short-lived governorship, when his focus was on the war effort, he ordered that the Catholic citizens of Limerick and Waterford be expelled from within the city walls, out of fear that they were a security risk for the vital ports. Later on, when he was Lord Deputy, Charles Fleetwood extended that order to all walled towns. Catholics were expelled from all urban centres, regardless of whether they were old medieval towns or new colonial settlements, and they were only permitted to live in the suburbs. This had dire consequences for those towns. Though it was much easier to get new Protestant settlers for the urban centres than it was for the countryside, the expulsion of Catholic merchants obviously disrupted long-standing trade links. Cork, Waterford, Limerick and Galway lost importance, while Dublin prospered. The ancient rights and privileges of the towns were voided by Ireton and his successors, and though they would be restored in the following years, they wouldn't be the same, and the governors of towns would be military officers, not burghers. Many of those expelled were forced onto the dangerous, plague-ridden, lawless roads, with all the misery and death that came with them. The expulsion of Catholic Irish from the towns was one of the earliest forms of transplantation, but soon enough the policy would be extended everywhere. Hello, Saver! Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name. But you may not realise the historical significance of the woman behind the name, or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. As usual in this period, Irish affairs were subject to political events in England, and in June 1653, the Council of State declared that the rebellion in Ireland was officially over. Now, the authorities in Dublin were to survey the whole country, fully implement the confiscations, transplantations and distribution of the seized lands to adventurers and soldiers. In September, the Act of Satisfaction was passed by a military-dominated parliament, more in the future, and this put into law the earlier decree of the Council of State. It also forbade Catholics from living in or entering ports or towns in Connacht or Clare. 
On paper, this legislation pushed the vast majority of Catholic landowners into Connacht. Any who were still in Ulster, Leinster, or Munster by the 1st of May 1654 would be, quote, refuted as spies and enemies, end quote. In the worst case, they would be executed. Once a landowner decided to transplant, they would register their details, name, family and household size, the extent of their land and the movable goods, and receive a transplanter's certificate. The idea was that they'd present this certificate to the transplantation commissioners based near Loch Ray and be allocated land in Connacht. Those Protestants who already had land in Connacht were offered property elsewhere in Ireland in exchange. The neighbourhood was about to become very hostile, after all. And if you're wondering, what about those Catholic landowners already in Connacht, whose land was being offered up to transplanters? Well, they got the same deal as the rest of their co-religionists. A portion of their land was confiscated, depending on how they'd acted during the war. They were also meant to be moved within the province to break up existing networks, but they usually just stayed put. Because despite the seriousness of the threat, and the fact that their land was officially confiscated, in reality most Catholic landowners didn't move. At this point, according to Lenehan, between a half and two-thirds of those who had registered their details actually made the journey. He notes that in Bantry, County Wexford, only 72 out of 256 landowners who were meant to be transplanted actually engaged with the process. Instead, they transformed from landlords to tenants, but stayed in their villages, if not the exact same houses. The deadline of the 1st of May passed, and former soldiers arrived at land they'd been awarded, and found tenants and former landowners who refused to be driven out. Violence followed. To try and keep the peace, the authorities offered extensions to those families who were willing to move, but needed more time, or who were waiting for the harvest. A new deadline of March 1655 was issued, with the order that the land's new owners be compensated for the delay. By the time this deadline passed, many more former landowners had made arrangements and travelled to Connacht, but Charles Fleetwood, the most hard-line Cromwellian Lord Deputy, proclaimed new orders for transplantation in July, apparently to the frustration of Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell. He'd apparently urged Fleetwood to quietly shelve the plans, and Fleetwood had ignored him. Derek Hurst, among others, have suggested that the Rump Parliament suspected that Cromwell would have been opposed to the extent and severity of the Act of Settlement. He wasn't yet Lord Protector then, but he was still highly influential, so they waited until he was safely out of the way to bring it to the House. Fleetwood's governorship represented the dominance of the army and the new Protestants, and their hardline view of Catholics and Irish affairs. In October 1653, he put together a new committee made up of army officers, including Colonel Richard Lawrence, the Governor of Waterford, who we'll hear more from in a moment, and Sir Hardress Waller. The next month, the government reiterated the order for transplantation and overruled any previous exemptions or exceptions. After the March 1655 deadline passed, Fleetwood's government ordered the army to arrest any Catholic landowner who still refused to transplant and to treat them as spies, to be charged put on trial, convicted, and executed. Some did face this fate. Those hanged had their bodies displayed with placards stating, for not transplanting. Others were transported to the colonies instead of the gallows. Throughout 1655, Fleetwood doubled and then tripled down. In April, Catholics already in Connacht were banned from receiving passes to leave the province. In May, Fleetwood ordered that Catholics be expelled from most walled towns and cities, including Galway, which had surrendered under terms that promised their citizens would be allowed to stay. But, despite the harsh wording of the laws, and the bloodthirstiness of certain officials, mass executions for refusing transplantation never happened. The zealotry and ruthlessness of Fleetwood and his advisers wasn't matched by those below them. But, nevertheless, By the time Henry Cromwell arrived and signalled the relaxing of the transplantation policy and sent Fleetwood back to England, thousands of Catholic landowners had been transplanted. One of the popular ideas of the settlement is that Connacht and County Clare were chosen as the destination for transplanted Irish Catholics 
because the land was poor quality and unfit for farming. In fact, though, the Commonwealth rated Connacht as quite good land, and not just in the quality of the soil, which they put above Ulster, but because it was relatively untouched by the war. The fighting reached the west of Ireland fairly late. So this region wasn't chosen as part of a long-term plan to starve the transplanted Irish, but instead the choice comes down to geography and security. Connacht was considered a specially safe place to put Catholic landowners, as the dangerous potential rebels they were because of the River Shannon and the Atlantic Ocean. The province of Connacht was relatively isolated from both Scotland and the Catholic powers of Europe, and the River Shannon posed a formidable barrier to travel over land. Connacht was also relatively uncolonised and unclaimed by Protestants already, but the Commonwealth wasn't going to leave security down to chance. Landowners who made the journey arrived and were granted land, but usually with the specific intention of dispersing those who came from the same communities as widely as possible. Again, this was meant to break up networks which might become dangerous conspiracies. That said, the commissioners in charge of allocating land weren't too fussed about that, and a well-placed bribe could ensure you got placed where you wanted. On top of dispersal, the Commonwealth also restricted Catholics from certain areas. We've already heard how urban centres were forbidden to them. In Connacht and County Clare, Catholics were further restricted from owning land near the towns and cities. In addition, a four-mile band of land along the coast was reserved for the settling of soldiers. This would help isolate the native Irish from the sea and foreign intervention. This band was later reduced to a single mile, which opened up more land for transplanters, and the entire barony of Clare was given over to Irish settlement. But in return, Sligo and a third of County Mayo were then reserved for Protestant settlers. Almost 30% of the province of Connacht was effectively forbidden to Irish transplanters, and there would be a shortage of land available even with the reduced numbers who actually transplanted. Because the heads of many transplanting families arrived in Connacht, prepared to set themselves up and then send for their family and household, and either found that there was no land available, the land allocated wasn't good enough, or they just changed their minds and went home, damn the consequences. Commonwealth officials were also divided. Other than the more extreme attitudes coming out of Fleetwood and his supporters, others took a more practical and humane approach. For example, in 1654, the governor of Drogheda issued a temporary exemption from transplantation for local Catholic Irish, because Drogheda needed them. The divide in opinion is most famously displayed in a debate which took place in 1655 between a Munster planter, Vincent Gookin, and the governor of Waterford, Richard Lawrence, I mentioned earlier. Their debate was public, and it illustrates a new division within the English Protestant community in Ireland. We now have old Protestants and new Protestants. Essentially, old Protestants were the new English before the rebellion. New Protestants were those who had come over since, usually soldiers and colonists of the Cromwellian settlement. Old Protestants tended to support the confiscation of land from rebellious Catholic landowners and their transplantation to Connacht, but that was usually the extent of it. The idea that all landowners should be treated as guilty, and especially that all Irish Catholics would be transplanted, was not just morally repugnant, it was practically impossible and economically stupid. These were the existing colonial elite who had learned what worked and what didn't, and the limitations of government policy from the earlier Tudor and Stuart plantations. They now watched with horror as the new guys turned up with their crazy ideas and shut them out of the conversation and from power. Gookin became the representative of these old Protestants, and he published the Great Case of Transplantation in Ireland Discussed, in January 1655, lobbying Parliament against universal transplantation. Lawrence's response, The Interest of England in the Irish Transplantation, stated, was published in March, and then Gookin gets the final word in two months later in May, with The Author and Case of Transplanting the Irish into Connacht Vindicated. To simplify their arguments, Gookin was critical of the policy or perhaps more aware of its limitations than was Lawrence. 
Gukin also railed against any idea of universal transplantation, a possible policy of removing all Irish Catholics, landowner or not, former rebels or not. Lawrence denied there was any plan for universal transplantation, but he did not rule it out, and in fact, he sung the idea's praises. Gukin's first tract was published anonymously, and so angered Lord Deputy Fleetwood and his supporters that Governor Lawrence felt he had to respond, quote, at the request of several persons in eminent place in Ireland, end quote. Lawrence's response justifies the transplantation policy by calling up memories of the Irish rebellion and the atrocities that followed. Harsh measures were needed to prevent another rebellion, especially because that rebellion had come out of nowhere. Of course, as we've seen, the rebellion and the violence it unleashed was fuelled by decades of mistreatment, discrimination and political exclusion. As a new Protestant official, though, Lawrence had an interest in presenting pre-1641 Ireland as a bastion of peace and good governance, which had been ruined by an ungrateful, antisocial and barbaric people who would just not settle down and enjoy the benefits of civilised rule. For the safety of settlers and the security of the government, the vast majority of native Irish should be expelled from the rest of Ireland and transplanted west of the River Shannon. Gukin dismisses this appeal to the atrocities of the rebellion in his follow-up tract, because if the policy wouldn't work, the historical justifications didn't matter. Gukin focuses on the practical reasons why universal transplantation would be a mistake, and insists that it was much better economically, as well as for English ambitions to convert and quote-unquote civilise the Irish, to have settlers and locals mixed together. An example raised by Sarah Barber in her chapter of British Interventions in Early Modern Ireland is that of agriculture. Agriculture was where the wealth of Ireland lay, and if the Commonwealth wanted Ireland to pay for itself, and the Commonwealth really wanted Ireland to pay for itself, then Irish agriculture needed to be safeguarded. Forcibly uprooting thousands of farmers, especially when there were not thousands of settlers ready to fill those gaps, would be a disaster. Lawrence and Gukin also differed over the view of Connacht. For Lawrence, the other three provinces of Ireland, Ulster, Leinster and Munster, had been ravaged by a war started by the Irish. They were now wastelands, their fields burned and empty, their towns and villages plagued with, well, plague. In contrast, Connacht was pristine, untouched by the war, and a perfectly acceptable place to put the native Irish. They should be happy to move there. Lawrence echoed other government sources that rated Connacht land as better than Ulster land. And anyway, the Irish had forfeited their right to the rest of Ireland by starting the war and ruining that land. But settlement by British colonists would restore the Irish wastelands in short order. Gukin took the opposite view. Connacht was not pristine. It was undeveloped. Sending the Irish there en masse would be a disaster for them personally and for the economic future of the island. It would be far better for everyone, Irish and British, if the ordinary Irish were left where they were, working the land they already worked, albeit under new English landlords. They could work for the Commonwealth, be converted to Protestantism, and eventually cease to be a threat. Gukin also questioned whether transplantation would make Ireland more peaceful and settlers safer. Expelling the native population from their land, concentrating them into a single area in Connacht, and not providing adequate support for them, would give tens of thousands of people the same uniting grievance and would surely increase the chance of unrest. Another rebellion could be on a scale that the Commonwealth could not suppress. Lawrence countered this view by suggesting that putting all potential Tories into one place, instead of scattered across the island, would make it much easier for the Commonwealth army to keep an eye on them. As far as Lawrence and the new Protestants were concerned, the Irish were going to resist English rule whatever the government did. It would be foolish to show leniency to a future enemy. In his arguments, Lawrence implicitly admits two things. The first is that security could not be guaranteed across the whole of Ireland. It was only if the Commonwealth's enemies, 
the Irish as a whole, as far as he was concerned, were all in one place, could safety be achieved. The second was his belief that the Catholic Irish could not be converted to Protestantism nor to quote-unquote civilization. This was a stark admission, especially for Lawrence, who was a fervent Baptist. But Baptists in Ireland were far more interested in converting other Protestants to their creed, not Catholics. It also displays one of the chief differences between the old and the new Protestants. The moral authority of previous colonisation had been that it would convert the Irish to the true religion and save their souls, as well as bring superior English customs and law to the island. But the rebellion had tarnished that motivation for the new Protestants. The uprising, the violence, and the decade of war that followed displayed the failure of that earlier approach, and proved to the hardliners that the native Irish were best kept apart, subjugated as tenants to a Protestant ruling class, and neither seen nor heard in the corridors of power. But to Gukin, the conversion of Catholic Irish to both the true religion and to English authority was not just the only way to secure the Commonwealth in Ireland, but it was the right thing to do. To quote Spurlock, for Gukin, conversion through amenable relations was not a luxury for the English regime, but a moral obligation. End quote. Gukin's pamphlets also acknowledge, with surprising self awareness, that the rebellion hadn't come out of nowhere. The native Irish had genuine grievances, and current government policy risked forcing people into violence out of necessity and resentment. I've covered this debate because I think it helps illustrate how divided the English were over how the settlement of Ireland should be conducted. Lawrence's extreme demands were favoured by many figures of importance, especially Charles Fleetwood, whose policy towards transplantation was, in the view of Lenehan, genocidal in scope. But this extreme view didn't win out. There was a reluctance, an unofficial dragging of feet from Fleetwood subordinates and officials, especially old Protestants. There were also practical limitations on how effective an early modern government could really be in tracking and enforcing its will on hundreds of thousands of people. And once Henry Cromwell arrived, the power balance shifted away from the army and the new Protestants and back towards the old Protestants. Transplantation was declared complete by the summer of 1657. In total, 1,130 landowners moved to Connacht and to Clare and received 700,000 acres in return. Before the rebellion, the war and the reconquest, Catholic landowners held almost 60% of land in Ireland. Once the confiscations were declared complete, in June 1657, Catholics owned, at most, 9%. Though there were exceptions, the vast, vast majority of Irish Catholic landowners forfeited at least a third of their estates and were ordered to move to Connacht. Though many of those landowners didn't make the trip, the landscape of Ireland was nevertheless changed. Next time, we will see how the colonisation of Ireland takes place as the confiscated land is doled out. Before I finish today, you might have noticed a change in the beginning of today's episode. I am very happy to say that over this past week, I formally passed my PhD and was awarded my doctorate, just in time for Christmas. Thank you to everyone who has listened to Pax Britannica over the years, and especially everyone who has financially supported me. Speaking of which, thank you to my House of Lords, including the King's favourite Mike Sanders, the Duke of Portland, Damien, the Marquis of Beaumont and Cressford, Philip Allen, and the Earl of Waterford, Dylan Drolet. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to join their ranks and listen to the podcast without ads. For the price of a coffee a month, you can receive the bonus content as well. Remember that you can join the mailing list to get news about the show by going to the link in the description. For other great podcasts on the Airwave network, check out airwavemedia.com. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. I will see you in the new year, and if you celebrate it, I hope you have a very Merry Christmas.
the regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy.